Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. To get involved, go to xyadvisor.com or simply download the XY Advisor app. Optimo Pathfinder is the next generation of financial modeling. Designed specifically for Australian financial advisors, Pathfinder allows you to develop and compare multiple financial strategies within minutes. With cutting-edge optimization and built-in legislation, it removes the burden of time-consuming modeling and report creation. Easy to use and easy to understand. It saves hours of manual work and allows you to turn around financial strategies in a fraction of the time. Take your business to the next level with Optimo Pathfinder. Hello and welcome to this series on one of my favorite topics, delivering advice differently. My name is Fraser Jack and in this series, we hear from an incredible panel of speakers. First up is Ben Martian, the Head of Policy, Strategy and Innovation at the Financial Planning Association. Then we have Prashant Nagarajan, co-founder of Melbourne-based advice firm Finical, and Michelle Bannister, CEO of Optimo Financial. Rounding out the conversation is Jeff Ivanak, financial and estate planner from Real Life Financial Planning in Perth. This is the first podcast in a series of five. In this episode, we start high level and discuss the evolution of advice delivery, where we've come from, and how that has shaped our mindsets and limitations of what advice could be in the future, and open the lid on what is possible. In episode two, we cover separating strategy from product. Uh, In episode three, we tackle using visuals for engagement. Uh, Episode four is all about demonstration of understanding and how you can empower clients. And rounding out the series, we take on creating a client-centric advice process as opposed to a compliance-directed advice process. For now, stay tuned as we kick off with our high-level theories on the evolution of advice delivery. Thank you for joining me, Ben Martian. Thanks for having me, Fraser. It's good to be here today. Fantastic to have you along. Now, we're talking about the evolution of the advice uh, delivery uh, in this particular episode. But before we uh, get into that, just give us a quick background of your yourself and your role at the moment. Uh, so, I'm Ben Martian. I'm the Head of Policy, Strategy and Innovation at the Financial Planning Association. Primarily, my role is government relations. And so, I read hundreds of pages of legislation and regulation and write long reports and responses back to government and have lots of conversations with them. So, as you can imagine, that's about as exciting as it sounds. Um, And so, my hobby and pastime as a nerd and a geek is technology. And so, I've been thinking for the last five, six years while I've been at the FPA how we can integrate technology into our advice practices and make advice more accessible to Australians, how to make it more affordable to provide advice and how to make it far more engaging to actually produce advice and provide it to clients so they better understand. Definitely a hot topic and probably on the mind of everybody listening to this particular podcast episode uh, with regards to, you know, how do we, you know, uh, provide advice differently? How do we uh, embrace technology to be able to do that? So, uh, exactly what we're talking about now, but before we get into the solution, let's actually start with the uh, the past and talk about the uh, the advice process itself and how it was created from, um, I guess, what was the you know Financial Services Reform Act in 2001, 2001, 2002? Yeah, well, we had the CLERPS, so CLERPS 6 in particular uh, before that in the late 90s. Um, there wasn't really much of an, a, a formal advice process prior to that, but um, with the introduction of the Corporations Act and the financial services reform, what we ended up with was rules effectively around disclosure. So we had specific requirements of what we needed to disclose to consumers, and we did the best we could with the technology that we had available at the time in, in the early 2000s. And so you think back in early 2000s, some of us who were geekier or nerdier were on the internet and using, using technology, but for the most part, you know, personal computers were, were in their early evolution. And so we were primarily using word processors and and Microsoft Word 
as the way that we delivered information to anybody. If we wanted to create something and want to share information with them, we we documented that using Microsoft Word. And so when you think about the fact that you had to disclose that you were, you, you had to document your statement of advice that you're providing, uh, you had to disclose certain information to the client about the recommendations you're making and the benefits and the drawbacks of those. You had to disclose the the costs of the advice that the client would receive. You had to disclose if you're replacing one product for another, the benefits and drawbacks of that. The best way to do that with the technology that was available at the time was was word based and effectively it was paper based um, because that's that's really the only way you could you could make sure the client had a copy of of the advice they received and so we have more or less been stuck in the early 2000s the early noughties in terms of the way we deliver advice to our clients because we haven't adapted with the times and we haven't changed the technology we use to deliver advice. Yes, and I guess, I mean, um, look, to be fair, when, when Word came in, it was, a, it was a massive leap forward from the typing pools of people having to type documents. And if you made one mistake, you had to start again. Uh, and obviously that meant our documents could get way longer, couldn't they? Because we could, you know, we can actually make changes and not worry about having to go back to the start of the typing. Um, but then I think, I hate to think how many trees we've uh, used up over the over the over over that 20-odd year period to um, to produce statements of advice um but i just wanted to go back to the point you mentioned around uh the corpse act and disclosure uh information because this is pretty important when we look at what the advice delivery can because we've still got those similar disclosure regime in place yeah um but it was very much around financial product sales right because that's how financial products were distributed they were sold um and so the the emphasis was very much around uh your providing information around financial product um, sales or financial products in general. Um, and then financial advice came in and there was this sort of weird thing. Is financial advice a product or is it, you know, is it actually, um, a service and, and, and talk us through that process with the, with regards to the corpse act. Yeah, well, I think that, I mean, the, the history of where most financial planners came from was, was effectively out of agency models or sales rep models, um, that, that big financial product products had out there so they would have a, a salesperson who would go around as a as a life insurance salesperson and so when they were thinking about how to regulate financial advice they regulated it effectively as a distribution of a product and so financial advice became defined unfortunately in the corporations act as a financial product it's a financial services service but it is it is regulated as a specific financial product which has effectively mean meant we've jammed advice into the same disclosure and um, re- you know reporting and information obligations that that financial products have. So you need to provide FSGs the same way financial products do. You have to provide a disclosure document um, in product space. It's a product disclosure statement in advice space. It's a statement of advice, but they aren't that massively dissimilar. Um, you need to on an annual basis when you when you run a product you have to provide statements of of the fees and the outcomes and we have to provide fee disclosure statements in terms of the fees that clients pay so we're regulating exactly the same way but the unfortunate thing is we're providing a professional service um we're not actually selling a, a product and so the the regulation of financial advice has gotten very messy over the last 20 years uh because of that that discrepancy yeah, this has become really interesting because obviously clients, um, you know, we think about the, the evolution clients were getting financial plans uh, and then it switched to them getting disclosure documents. I'm going to say documents because that's what they were getting. Um, and financial advice became about selling a disclosure versus, you know, versus giving people a plan. Well, this is the problem because when you sell a product, you physically sell something. You sell somebody investing into a product or you sell an insurance product. And so this same analogy came through to advice. And so effectively what you ended up with was was products who were involved in advice. We have to sell something. And so we're going to sell the statement of advice. And so that became the focal point of how advice was provided and therefore what was what was the focal point of the advice process it was selling that statement of advice 
that's never been where the value has been for consumers. That's never been where the value that a financial planner provides to their client. Um, it has been in helping them understand their goals and their objectives. It's been helping them create a financial plan. And most importantly, it's been holding them accountable to achieving that financial plan. And that allows consumers to sleep at night knowing that their financial position is looked after. Their financial plan position is secure. They know what they can spend. They know what's coming in. They know what their assets are. They know what their liabilities are. And that provides a lot of comfort and value to the client. It's not in that document, that 80 to 100 page document, the 80 to 100 pages of paper that we're providing to the client, which ultimately goes into the back of the filing cabinet and, and goes out of date the day after it's provided and is never seen or heard of again. But the view of licensees, the view of the Corporations Act, the view of regulators is has been for a long time that that is ultimately what we're selling. Yeah, that's that's super interesting. Now, that also the um, out of the Corps Act, obviously, an, uh, an act to regulate corporations, not necessarily advice providers, but corporations. We ended up with uh, licensees, which were, you know, obviously back then larger groups, um, larger the um, could create more scale, and you know, paying for the the legal teams to provide advice. That corporate then needed to protect itself uh, as an entity. Um, so you've got a lot of legal advice. That legal advice was to protect yourself against the client suing you or against the client. The, this, this to me is a bit of a fundamental. We've stopped providing clients with what they needed and, and the, which is the information to make an informed decision uh, and started looking at this or coming into it, the advice process by creating an advice process that was compliance-led as opposed to consumer-led. And when I say as opposed to, I'm saying that because I mean compliance was – the, the idea of protecting the corporations involved versus what the client actually needed. So I think there's been two issues. The first issue is that we effectively have very rules-based regulation. And so from a licensee's perspective, what they need to do to prove to the regulator and if there's a complaint from a consumer is that they've followed all of the laws and regulations that they need to to make sure that the advice is provided um, legally. And so you have this check ticker box approach where you check off the box. Have you provided the FSG? Does the FSG have all of this information? Have you done an SOA? Does the SOA cover page have all of these bits of information? And so you just tick, 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 tick. And so you have this outcome which is not focused really from a from a licensee's perspective on the client it's focused on have we ticked all the boxes the second issue is that the medium that we have chosen to provide advice in is flat it's a flat piece of paper that you have to print on and so you're restricted to an a4 piece of paper now people's lives are are four dimensional right so we've got you know, we live in a three-dimensional world. We travel through time and space as the fourth dimension. And it's really hard to compact a person's life and their goals and their objectives and their financial assets and their financial liabilities and how those all interact with each other. Recommend products in the physical world. So we're going to put money in these products or we're going to pay premiums into an insurance product. It's really hard to compact that onto an A flat A4 piece of paper using mainly typed words in a way that that is is engaging and and under, and will allow the client to understand it. And so when you combine ticker boxes and a medium that doesn't allow you to demonstrate properly goals and objectives and financial position and what you're ultimately recommending and then you have to somebody ultimately will come and have a look at that advice and that file it becomes really difficult to understand whether or not the advice was appropriate to the client whether or not you fully understood the client whether or not the client fully understood the advice whether or not the advice is in the best interest of the client because you've got to make assessments off a flat piece of paper um, maybe a more bigger file, but often just a flat piece of paper about whether or not you've complied with the law. And it's become very, very difficult. And so you have a lot of disclosures, you have a lot of length, you've got a lot of explanations that don't necessarily need to be there when you speak to a client and can scale the advice up and down. 
Yeah, I really, I really like that way of looking at it. Um, you know, a flat dimensional um, process. That's where we're at now, I guess, um, in, in mm. a four dimensional, um, something that we need to cover four dimensions of. Tell us about then in that case, if that's where we're at now, what, what does the future hold? I think from what we're doing as the FPA, you know, we've been having a lot of conversations with lawmakers and a lot of conversations with regulators and with licensees and lawyers and compliance experts, with members, with consumers. And when you actually have a look at the laws and you have a look at the regulations, there's actually nothing stopping us from creating these live and engaging disclosure documents uh, to provide provide advice. Let's change it to statements, disclosure statements rather than documents. Disclosure statements. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. So how can we provide a statement of the advice that we're providing in a much more live and engaging way? So the future of advice delivery is absolutely not paper-based. Uh, the future of advice delivery is 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 live. It, it's it's video. It's audio. It's uh, interactive graphics. It will update live over time, um, and that's a much more engaging way for clients to to live their financial plan, to experience their financial plan, to understand their financial plan so that it's scalable and addresses the information that they need to make decisions about their life, their financial position, the products they're going to to use to achieve their financial goals and objectives. So we've been working a lot on that with, with regulators and, and lawyers and licensees and compliance experts to try and bring this concept to life and, and help our members uh, create these type of, of advice, statements of advice. Yeah, fantastic. And uh, and I want to get into a bit more of that uh, as we go through this series. So we'll, we'll probably come back to that particular point a few times. But uh, for now, uh, Ben, thanks so much for being part of this first episode uh, and how we talk about advice being delivered differently. All right. Thanks, Fraser. Thanks, everyone. Welcome to this first episode. I am joined by Prashant and Michelle, and we are talking about the evolution of the advice process. Uh, but before we get there, I want to jump in. Uh, Prashant, I'm going to start with you. Tell us a little bit quickly about yourself and your background. Uh, hi, Fraser. Um, thanks for having me here. Um, so my background, I first um, started, uh, I am a financial advisor now, and uh, I first started in this line of work at about 2009. Uh, I started the journey as a client manager, working out for an advisor and handling the appointments and that sort of thing. Uh, and that was back in the Gold Coast. And then um, we, I sort of uh, moved into advice, worked for um, ANZ and then a few boutique firms after. Um, and around uh, 2017, I decided to let go of uh, the steady paycheck and, uh, and, and get started uh, um, with the mission to help young families with their money. Um, I was, uh, um, you know, we started this business um, with uh, Daniel Thompson, who's my, uh, who's the co-founder of uh, Finical as well, um, and then it's been almost four years now since we officially opened the doors and, uh, um, you know, started doing what we do. Um, so it, the journey has been incredibly, uh, you know, um, humbling, uh, and there's been a lot of uh, learning, um, and uh, you know, um, in this whole whole thing and we're really excited to be where we are now fantastic and i'm looking forward to get into the, getting into those learnings along uh, your journey uh, michelle let's uh let's quickly chat about uh, your past and history how, how uh, tell us about your journey uh, to where you are now in my current role, I'm the CEO of Optimo Financial. So, you know, we do a uh, software modeling technology for financial advisors, but I'm not a financial advisor by background. I do have an accounting background, but really what's taken, what's been my interest through my career is business and process improvement. So, I see financial planning really like any other business that you want to improve the processes of. And that's what I'm really interested in. How do we help financial advisors improve their processes? Yeah, fantastic. Now, let, now let's get into the, um, the the idea around advice delivery and the evolution of advice delivery because it's obviously it's come a long way from you know, uh, well, or maybe it hasn't come a long way, but uh, certainly from the days of you know when there was product distribution sales to be made through to you know this becoming a financial advice and and then uh, you know that client journey. Uh, and somewhere along the way, there was com it became a compliant process as well, and and you know compliance led. Uh, Prashant, tell us about um, your journey because obviously you started uh, as, a, as a client manager, you know, started with the client, started with understanding, you know, the, the client's pain points and those sorts of things. Uh, talk, talk to us about what you you perceive as the, the journey that we've come along in the advice process. 
I guess uh, um, my observation of the journey is I think we've definitely in the last you know 10, 10 plus years I've, I've, I've been here um, it's definitely moved away from product uh, you know that's the first thing that you'd notice is the products now you know something that comes in the end now you know it's just it's it's uh, um, and there's been a lot of focus on goals and strategy and client experience and you know it's it's definitely turning to be a lot more client centric um, and that's um, you know, uh, well, I guess 10 years ago, people would have still said I'm client centric. Now, the level to which this is actually going is is incredible. Like you go to any conference or seminar, it's hard to get away without having a session dedicated around client experience, you know, a session dedicated around this. It is it is now a buzzword and it's just getting honed into everyone, regardless of what age the advisor is. You know, you could be a 60-year-old advisor or a 20-year-old advisor. It doesn't matter. Um, so I'm seeing that to be the first uh, um, change which is uh, which is great uh, which means that you know clients have uh, you know a lot a deeper relationship with the advisor and vice versa uh, the other thing i'm noticing is uh, adaptation and using technology um, and and the, the embrace around that uh, the next buzzword i think i've noticed in the last five years is around efficiency uh, it's around you know doing this faster quicker you know that sort of thing uh, that's uh, probably the next um, thing uh, and obviously the cost to produce advice has been um, and the client affordability indirectly um, has also been a part of this you know efficiency journey so I guess these are the two things I'm, I'm really observing uh, change in the in in the industry yeah now if we uh, Michelle I'll throw to you if we go back uh, in, into the past and you look at the traditional advice process and, and I guess coming at this from the angle of you know business process and efficiencies and uh, you know and you, and within your background and understanding the numbers that sit behind such a business tell us about the the evolution and from your opinion especially if we start sort of with the past the way we used to be. Prashant's definitely hit, hit all the sort of nails on the on the head when you look at it from a process perspective you know what you see is you know originally the focus being very much around you know the product and quite you know labor intensive processes to be able to deliver advice um, you know even just looking at things like the statement of advice things like that being very focused on the compliance aspect so I think you know where we seem to be moving and where the opportunities for improvement are definitely around how do we improve the client experience you know how do we improve the turnaround times importantly how do we lower the cost of advice in all of this because still there are huge sort of manual processes, double handling of data, you know, frustrations of lack of integration of software. You know, there's still a lot of manual work that's happening in this process. And so I think huge opportunities going into the future of, you know, how do you improve all those things, improve the client experience, and then at the end of the day, lower the cost of advice. So advisors can can turn a dollar and also pass some of those savings on to, you know, their clients. Yeah, Michelle, um, just on that, there's, uh, I, I get with most businesses, you know, labor is one of the most expensive parts of any mm. process um, and, and having humans do work, um, you know, in that process. Um, are you are you seeing that, um, you know, that that's sort of the same thing with advice and, the, and one of the biggest efficiencies that can be gained or the, the, t- the dollars and again in time can be done with the, the human process? Yeah, so I think there's just, I mean, a really big part of the whole process is the modeling aspect of it, just the time that's taken to do the number crunching, the back and forth, trying different scenarios. Traditionally, it's been a very labor intensive process, also just because of the complexity of all our super laws, regis- legislation, um, you know, tax rules. If you don't have good processes, that is very labor intensive. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Now, um, Prashant, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about was uh, with the advice process was, you know, we, we touched on compliance and obviously everything needs to be compliant. Um, but a lot of the time, I think the process was built around the concept of we need to create a compliant process, not necessarily create a process that's client centric. That's correct. That's correct. I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, the last decade, the post GFC changed, you know, uh, that completely for everyone and it was a it's been a um uh, i guess a bureaucratic journey for all advisors and uh um yeah it 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 is unfortunate but 
again, I'd say same as like you just said, it is it is necessary to be uh, compliant. It's more these rules are there for a reason, you know. These rules are there to guide us. But I think, I think there's nothing stopping us from building client experience around this, you know. There is nothing stopping us from putting the old wine in a new bottle, so to speak, you know, and, and I think that's uh, um, what we are trying very hard to do in the last four years is to, you know, uh, not break the rules, but, you know, keep it as it is, but make it, you know, wrap it up in a pretty, pretty gift wrap, you know. Um, so that, yeah. yeah. Now, I want to, I want to ask you about this process because yourself and uh, Daniel, your business partner, obviously sat down and um, mm. spent a lot of time on mapping this out and then working mm. out. Um, what are those touch points going to be? Tell tell us about that process that you and Dan went through to to do that. Um, I'd like to start with keeping it brief, but I'll let you sort of you know uh, dwell into it depending on which ones you feel is worthwhile. So back when we started, this was um, our mission was to provide affordable advice for young families, and because historically, um, both Daniel and I we served and you know a client, an average client was. 55, 60 years old. That was sort of the age range we were dealing with. Um, and the the common repetitive theme we were finding was either it was about finding ways to stretch their money, you know, or it was usually too little too late, you know. And uh, after five years of doing that, we just got frustrated and said, you know, let's just go meet these guys 20 years younger. And, you know, and obviously affordability was a big part. I mean, uh, we were at that age. I was around 30 back then and Daniel was the same. We've never paid for a grind ourselves for any professional service, you know, and how do I expect someone like me to do exactly that? Uh, I think the highest professional service I paid for myself was a conveyance of about $1,000 or something, you know. That, that was literally an advisor's, uh, you know, uh, journey there. So we were pretty much going we started off this journey to say okay here's the market we serve we wanted to find their pain point we set out um, with a couple of paid surveys and everything finding what what problem they were willing to pay for sure there was super there was all these other stuff that was they'd like to fix but they were not willing to pay for the only problem that they said here's a problem and i'm willing to pay for this was the idea of home home ownership that 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 was a big pain point for the thirty year old family market back then. Okay, technically a house is not a financial product; it doesn't fall under the the regime, so to speak. But then everything that leads up to it, you know, the journey to get to that is a financial journey. So we then far, sort of deconstructed the whole financial advice process to go. Uh, and, and, and try to fit that market from a savings plan to using super as a stepping stone, like the first home super saver scheme, like everything around us that will help a first home buyer's journey, you know? And that's how we de- deconstructed that, which allowed us to sort of have a predictable solution for a problem, you know? When I say not a templated solution, but it's more a predictable series of steps. Um, and then we wanted to, you know, um, we tested that out and then we tried to enhance, you know, have multiple touch points, feedback points and so on and so forth and try to make experience better using that. Um, and then like, you know, first one was we winged it at about $99 a month in terms of service fee because we didn't know what people were willing to pay. Yes, that was f- commercially not viable, but we wanted to start somewhere. And then slowly, you know, the refining, refining and refining. Now we sort of, you know, uh, we found that sweet spot where people feel valuable and it's not costing a fortune and everyone's happy. Um, and and uh, yeah, it's taken us a couple of years to get there. But yeah. Thanks, Prashant. And so in, in this process, obviously, that you're putting together, there's a lot of, as you mentioned, touch points uh, in that process that then come back to um, – to for the client and obviously affordability um uh, you know those touch points as you mentioned 99 dollars a month is not commercially viable unless you're implementing certain amounts of um, efficiency in your process and, and and even automation um have you done automation in your process Prashant? we have but i'd say we haven't nailed it yet so to speak it's still work in progress but that's a big priority for us um, we've automated as much as possible. We're trying to, we just had this phase where we're trying to 
um, you know, um, humanize where we must and mm-hmm. automate where we can. And we're finding that delicate balance of, uh, you know, which ones we shouldn't, even though we can, and which ones we 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 uh, would not uh, we we should, you know. So that's where we're at on that. Um, but yeah, definitely efficiency is massive, um, and it's. Uh, um, it's like basically the cornerstone of what we're doing in, in that because um, we've got as a model we've we've we 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 don't operate most and I have never seen an advisor operate like how lawyers do you know just go for the hourly billables and no one knows what's there we sort of all operate in a fixed fee thing so pretty much we cap ourselves on the upside you know uh, where you know it doesn't matter uh, if it's a 40 hour 50 hour work we cap ourselves with what we quoted initially um, so I think the need to sort of deliver everything as quickly as possible and as you know, with speed and accuracy, both, you know, both are important. I think it's, it's uh, yeah, it is very critical right now. More than I absolutely ever. love that approach, Prashant. You really nail it from a business improvement perspective, as well, you know, looking at that human side, what are the bits that we must humanize? And that's the bit that the customers really see and value and are face-to-face. Everything that's in the background that they don't see, that they're the bits that you can really harness technology and processes and get that working as efficiently as absolutely possible. Yeah, it's often that human human side that uh, relates the back to the client's values and goals and hopes and dreams and all those sorts of things. And it's taking those numbers and, and humanizing them. In, the, in that process, obviously, um, we, you know, we've had some technology with regards to online meetings come uh, in over the last couple of years in the advice process. I've seen the, the evolution of online and, and hybrid meetings and, and, and so certainly less in person. Uh, tell us about how that's working within your business, Prashant. We started our service delivery via Zoom back in 2018 prior to COVID, uh, it was one of those affordability decisions that we had to make um, for, for the end user. But that's massively changed in the sense, in terms of uh, the customer adaptation, because back then we were explaining what this is and it's going to be okay. We were, there was a lot of reassurances and now it's just a given. Uh, but where this is now enhancing the whole advice process is it's all of a sudden making advice scalable than before. Before, you know, we, our, you, most advisors that I know can't handle more than three meetings a day. They're either exhausted, there's a lot of pre and post work, all of those things. But now, five meetings a day just seems to be a normal thing. I'm finding a lot of advisors that I speak to, it's normal. It's sort of, you're sort of seeing that move from one client per day to sort of almost like a GP model, if you can, you know, of course, it's not that uh, quick, but, you know, we, we are being able to do that. So I think it's freed up a lot of advisors capacity, the businesses capacity. And then interestingly, the client experience is just out of the world because now they're able to see what we're seeing, share screens, you know, they're not, you know, um, they, well, you know, they don't have to worry about their child anymore. You know, they're, they're here. It's it's much more engaging um, unintentionally. I think it's done a lot of good than bad. Surely, yes, we, we miss that, you know, that face-to-face interaction once in a while. But, uh, you know, the clients, to me, the clients are paying us for an outcome. Uh, and and uh, that's, that's the one we want to be focused on. Yeah, it, it certainly seems with online meetings, there's obviously... There's a practical, it's like moving from snail mail to email, but uh, there, there was a couple of things missing in online meetings, obviously proximity being one, you know, you can't shake hands, for example, uh, in an online meeting. Um, what are your thoughts about the online meeting with the, in the advice process, Michelle? Yeah, I mean, I think there are pros and cons. There are some, um, you know, fantastic efficiencies that we can take hold of. I mean, just as Prashant mentioned, the screen sharing side, to be able to show your screen, you know, you can do that in terms of modelling or graphs or what if scenarios, all of that kind of stuff. There's this opportunity to to share and engage with clients in a whole new way, which is really exciting. You know, I think the other side is you have to really work hard against the fact that there's a screen in front of you. It does focus on the soft skills to be able to build that trust and rapport. And there are some challenges there. It's pros and cons. It's taking hold of the good that can propel us forward and trying to overcome those obstacles that get in the way and are challenges. Yeah, trust and rapport is a a massive one with online meetings. I'm actually... 
uh, a fan of the idea that you know you can actually have more online meetings, as you mentioned, Prashant. You, you don't actually have to have a, a, a 45 or an hour long meeting. You can have a 10 or 15, 20 minute catch up with somebody because they haven't traveled all the way to get to your office or you haven't traveled. It, it, it kind of feels like if you've traveled somewhere, you need to spend at least an hour with somebody versus uh, you know the online meeting where you can actually have five meetings in the process rather than you know two or three because you, you're able to have short, sharp meetings. What are your thoughts, Prashant? Absolutely, absolutely. I think I'm find we're finding that um, you know unintentionally we're finding that we're building better trust this way. Just because what what we um, with our process we, we're finding that we break we have a multi touch point process. You know, so so we have short sharp meetings, but more of them. So if you think about the amount of hours we spent on a client over a year, it's maybe slight, only slightly higher than the traditional model, you know, but we're having much more quick that five, 10 minute bursts. And we're finding that the trust, and this is something we learned somewhere where we found that if, if two people met each other for one hour, and then in a parallel universe, they met each other six times for 10 minutes, they'll trust each other on the, on that parallel universe versus this one. Um, and I think there's a, there's a psychology to it. And we're finding that we're definitely recognizing that. Yeah, definitely missing the face-to-face element, but it's, it's not coming. The Zoom world is not coming at a compromise of trust. You know, it's not compromising that is where, where I'm. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point to make. Um, now, as we look at the future of the advice process, uh, Michelle, I'll start with you. What what sort of things do you think could be involved in the you know the future advice process that um, would enhance the client experience or enhance the process itself, or maybe even things that we might take away from the process? I mean, I think some of the things that are the real opportunities um, around technology so efficiency some of that is having the software support to be able to do all the number crunching in the background so that you can spend more time with the client where it counts Um, some of the other things that we're seeing that advisors are doing that are really cool is doing modeling with clients putting them in the driver's seat so being able to show different what if scenarios and that can be really powerful from an education point of view but also an engagement point of view too to take their ideas on board and show them the power of of those options that they're considering Yeah, I really like the idea of being able to, you know, provide the client with the opportunity to build their own, you know, fill their own, uh, you know, adventure type of thing, you know, build their own adventure, adventure, um, look at the, look at the journey and say, what, what, what if I change this? What if I do that? Um, To really take ownership. Um, Prashant, what, uh, tell us about the future. What can you see happening in the future that's going to improve the advice process? Um, I think co-creating the customer's future is going to be, uh, and uh, you know, a part of this where I think we're going to go away from um, I'm the advisor. I'm going to tell you what's what's best, you know, kind of thing. I think there's more educated um, clients. You know, clients are more. You know, we're in that world of information. Uh, it's it's. I, I'm finding that we're seeing less and less. I don't know what to do. Kind of people versus I think this is what I want to do. People. Um, you know, there's more of that. And I think the co creation process and a little bit of unlearning and relearning as advices as well. You know, not to have that rigidity and sort of let the client come up with the framework and you operate within, bring your creativity within those frameworks kind of thing. I think we're going to see more of that. Um, we are also, um, you know, because, and again, irrespective of the client's age, um, we're finding that we are all becoming that Netflix generation, everyone, you know, that instant, the instant, uh, uh, you know, nature of I want this done and I want this done tomorrow. Uh, and the fact that, you know, still till today, clients still in, 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 know in our work can't comprehend why it's taking three to four weeks to implement what we just spoke about because we're waiting for this SOA thing and you know all of that so I think that's going to shrink I think that will eventually shrink and we're going to go towards uh, um, an efficient diagnosis to implementation very quickly Uh, it could take five years but I, I think we'll be getting there yeah uh, Michelle and Prashant thank you so much for being on this episode we look forward to catching you in the next episode Thank you for joining me in this first episode of Five, Jeff. Oh, pleasure to be uh, joining you, Fraser. Fantastic to have you. Now, uh, let's give the listeners a very quick overview of you and your business at the moment. Okay, yeah. So I guess the best way to describe us would be uh, comprehensive uh, financial advice. So ranging from uh, estate planning, which is our key pillar, uh, which is where we start our conversations, through to ongoing advice, which is really helping 
our clients make transformational changes in their life, as we like to call it, rather than uh, purely focused on achieving financial goals, which are important, but really it does leave you wondering what's next. So. Yeah, exactly right. Now we're, we're focusing the series a lot on the concept of advice delivered differently. And, and as you mentioned in uh, that, that previous uh, quick, quick uh, introduction to yourself, you do start with estate planning and, and uh, tell us about how that's come to be and, and, and why that's part of your, why that's where you lead with your advice process. Yeah. Well, first and foremost, I thoroughly enjoy that area of advice. Um, I originally started doing that when I was working uh, for a large accounting firm in the estate planning division, or estate and succession, uh, which had a lot of rural clients, which was very top of mind for them. Uh, And I really enjoyed the digging in, getting involved in the nitty gritty, and realizing uh, that this was a foundation for all advice. So accounting, uh, wealth creation, retirement planning, you really needed to start there. So... And the more and more I I learnt about it, the more I found that it was an area which slipped between the cracks, between accounting, uh, legal and financial. So I enjoyed it. I uh, sort of stayed in that area and then uh, it's become an integral part of where I've ended up. Yeah, exactly, exactly right. And so, and we'll get into a little bit more of that as we go through these episodes. Um, but uh, let, let's go through the, um, I guess the the time horizon of uh, you know the, the the background of the evolution of advice. You have, uh, you know, as as the industries evolved, obviously you have too. Um, from from what you're doing, are you certainly, as you said, you started in a different area than a lot of people. You weren't, you know, that the, the the evolution of the industry sort of started in product sales and moved through to, you know, doing a three, you know, 180 degree turn for advice. Uh, but you sort of came in at a different angle. I, I have this visual of you sort of coming in from the sideline. Uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I um, I, I wasn't a, uh, still am a chartered accountant, but. I came from that sort of technical uh, side of the profession, and then I I was fortunate then to see lawyers working and financial planners, and realised that there was a big gap, and it was linking all those two together, and so it was a different angle, and I, I certainly didn't come from a product uh, um, side, so more from the advice, and used to being able to charge for the advice as well. Yeah, this is a really interesting point because um, it's very, uh, you know, a lot of the conversations that we tend to have around this, the advice process tend, and, and modelling the advice process on other professions and obviously you're coming in from a, an accounting and a, uh, you know, a legal or estate planning background um, and the concept, I want to I want to go through that concept of just all, all, always charging for advice and having that just as a mindset versus having to change your mind to then I'll start to charge for advice rather than getting paid on product. Um, tell me about that and how you've observed and what observations you've made of the the profession itself as to you know that, that struggle that a lot of people are going through. Yeah, I, I sort of um, as an observer, I, I was I sort of I was quite intrigued how. Um, I always noticed that people could charge a phenomenal amount of money for just signing a piece of paper, and I, I've and they sort of justified it in many many different ways, and none of them really stacked up, and still don't. So, so I, I prefer to sort of engage at upfront, and and show this is where you are now, and this is what your feelings are, and this is where we want to take you. And that's my cost is to take you from here to there. And, and obviously a trick is to do that succinctly and in a, um, efficient way. Um, and then, then, so that's the engagement part. And then, so then you're able to say, this is what the cost of advice will be to take you on this journey. And, and these are all the things we will do along that way. So no commissions and rather doing that has an advice process rather than a product sales process. So that- yeah, this is that's a, that's a I'm I'm really taking note of some of the the exact words you're using in that uh, when you're talking about this being an emotional state, you're taking them from an emotional journey from a point A to point B, not necessarily a financial journey from point A to point B, which is often what uh, I guess the advice um, process is linked to. It's linked to this better position financially whereas what we're i guess what we're talking about in the evolution of advice that you've come through is that it's always been 
an emotional state to an emotional state. Yeah, I, I actually, yes, for sure. I, I actually um, is so say with estate planning is an easy one to look at is that feeling someone has when they know their affairs in order and the family's going to be looked after and that doesn't matter if they're here or not, their life will carry on. And all the all the ducks in a row, they they'll be able to the children will be able to live their life out, have purpose, have meaning. And it doesn't matter they're not there. So I, that's sort of where I started in that area. Then I've just taken that a little bit further with uh, financial planning, which has, has, has many different elements. Uh, there could be seven or eight things involved in that process as well. Yeah, fantastic. Now, um, one of the things that I wanted to quickly highlight here is that, um, you know, from technology point of view, from a consumer point of view, um, they're probably used to getting technology uh, you know, improvement at a very high rate, you know, obviously, you know, with the, the, the concept of technology coming a long way over the last 10 years since, since uh, say, smartphones were introduced and all that sort of thing, uh, and the amount of technology used in the advice process, whether it be the estate planning or even the, uh, the financial planning process, um, sort of just hasn't really kept up. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on where technology has been able to provide uh, help in the, in the advice process? Yeah, no, I'll, actually, because um, <clears throat> what – from what I do is obviously not a here sign here press hard process. Uh, I have to leverage technology quite a bit, and uh, so when I started as a finance, a strict financial advisor, I did go on a bit of a search to find uh, software that was easy to use and that I could use, because <laughs> I'm certainly no technical or IT guru. Actually, I'm a little bit of dinosaur, so it has to be. Very easy to use, like like an iPhone without giving an iPhone a plug. So, uh, uh, so I have been on that journey with the um, software developers, and a good example is when I started out doing estate planning <coughs> for, say, a mum and dad, which is very hard to make it cost effective. I used to do it manually. I used to draw up a family tree on a whiteboard, um, record their assets, liabilities, and extremely labor intensive and you know I'm also not uh, that proficient with word processing and then I discovered a software and I could capture the client's data uh, generate what I needed uh, for them with a few clicks and a bit of homework by the clients so that's really enhanced my ability to deliver cost effective estate planning solutions so technology is Fantastic. And it is evolving and it's certainly a key pillar to be able to provide cost effective financial advice. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, just inside, inside of your process, as we look at the evolution um, of advice for you, uh, where's it heading? Uh, you know, you've obviously come a long way from and, and moulded it into where you are today, but tell us about what, what your thoughts are around the future, where it could be heading and, and what you might be looking forward to. Yeah, so I, I enjoy what I do, but I do find I have to do a lot of hacking. So I have to hack this, then hack that together with that, and hack that together with that. And that doesn't make for a very pleasant experience, and, and I prefer to just, uh, sounds a bit uh, airy-fairy, but to be in the flow and uh, to for it to all fit seamlessly. So <clears throat> I'm enjoying what I'm doing, and I'm able to produce good outcomes for the client. So so my um, utopia is when all the different tools that I use uh, can integrate with each other and, and then I can um, start the process at one end with what I feel like I need to use to properly engage the client and deliver the best transformational outcomes with the end product at the other end and then all those things to be talking to each other and also uh, recording important information that will help me on that client's journey. So that's that's where I'm hoping technology uh, goes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly right. Uh, and uh, do you see anything, simp uh, you know, within the advice process itself, say, say not in technology, evolving over time, whether the, whether the advice process gets more or less complicated or, or any other changes to the advice process you think, think can see coming on or think might happen? Or maybe you wish to happen. <laughs> well, I'm yeah, I'm sort of <laughs> yeah. It's a good point. So the uh, 
having, like most advisors, been through the um, Phasia educational requirements recently, and fortunately came out at the other end, still still intact. The there's a whole new layer of um, requirements there, which I, I don't disagree with. I think they're certainly very an important part of delivering the good advice. So I think the future for software is to integrate with those requirements so that it is a seamless process and not a hack, you know, having a suite of compliance tools sitting over here that I have to comply with than what I do over here, but they do need to be integrated, not just a traditional 50 page fact find document, which you're trying to join 15,000 different dots to give someone what they want. So it's that integration of the two to make the whole experience better for the user. That is the key for me. It's a really good way of looking at it, having a whole lot of dots scattered across uh, across a, a zone and all we want to try and do is line the dots up. Uh, Jeff, thanks so much for uh, uh, chatting to us in this first episode. We look forward to catching you in episode two. Uh, my pleasure. Thanks very much, Fraser. Mm-hmm.